another part of the landscape that we've been tracking is the fact that the media is like the most hawkish group in the entire country. Right, right. And they only ever, and not just in this particular circumstance, but they only ever push in favor of more escalation and more war. We saw this really clearly with their coverage in Afghanistan. You know, they didn't give a shit about Afghan mm-hmm. civilians for 20 years. And then the minute Biden actually tries to end the war, then for like two weeks, they actually care about Afghan civilians. And then once it's over, they again, once again, don't care. And so what we see here is a consistent drumbeat. They're not pushing the administration over what Ryan Grimm is, saying, hey, what are you doing to enable peace? What are you doing to push for diplomacy here? No, they're consistently pushing for more escalation, potentially provoking World War III. This is a video compilation put together by The Intercept of the questions that are being asked of uh, the Biden administration routinely. Let's take a look at that. Why does the U.S. believe they know better what Biden needs than what Ukrainian officials are saying they need the most? It sounds like, you know, we're pretty dug in on our position when it comes to the no-fly zone, when it comes to uh, the MiGs, uh, despite this growing call, bipartisan call in Congress to shift a little bit. So to put it bluntly, is Zelensky wasting his time tomorrow asking for these things? President Zelensky is going to be speaking to Congress tomorrow. He's been pushing for fighter jets, a no-fly zone. You have to hear some of those same requests tomorrow as well. Has the administration shift, thinking shift them that at all? Uh, calling for a no-fly zone. They're a NATO <laughs> member. They share a border with Russia. How do we view their calls for a no-fly zone? Yeah. And on President Zelensky's address tomorrow, of course, he is expected to ask for more assistance, as my colleague noted. A lot of the U.S. positions on that haven't changed, as you just said, when it comes to the no-fly zone. But on the aircraft specifically, the Pentagon said last week that Secretary Austin said they do not support the transfer of additional fighter aircraft at this time. Is that still the United States' position? Would a a strike in Poland on supplies or or anything, really, uh, automatically be met with a military forceful response, which would be a conversation amongst allies about how to respond? There are reports that a Russian drone made its way into uh, Polish airspace before going back to Ukraine and being shot down. Does a drone into Poland count? Former ambassador to Ukraine, Maria Ivanovich, has been quite outspoken recently. And she said, we need to mitigate risk, but it's also true that not taking greater action comes with a risk as well, because Putin is a bully and he only understands strength. Is the president showing enough strength against Putin? Putin were to use chemical weapons, would it change the president's thinking when it comes to these MiGs taking the no-fly zone off the table, but at least on this issue? What you prepared, can you give us any more details about what that threat means of severe consequences? The president obviously made the same threat last week. Is that purely economic consequences, or would there potentially be a military threat? Wow. So you see there just consistent every question. What about the no-fly zone? But what about the no-fly zone? But what about the MiGs? Tell me more about the MiGs. And to the point that Saki actually just recently noted, she has answered that question about the planes, she says, 167 times, to which Kristen Welker there says, well, here's the 168th. If you want to know why I had to get the hell out of that room, <laughs> that's why. I, rem- I remember just looking around and be like, oh, you guys are idiots. You don't you don't know anything. I mean, you're very good at posturing on television. That's, I guess that's a skill. Uh, that's it. I mean, they're unable to see a complete one dimension of the impact of their questions, of their policy, how they can create the, you know, the systems and the incentives of which the policymakers will then respond to. They are outright pushing for World War III. Why don't you send more weapons? Who are you to decide that you know better than Zelensky? We're not saying that we know better for them that in Ukraine, we know what's good for us. That's the job of the US government. They have no conception of sovereignty. And over and over and over and over again. Why not more? Why not more? You can see exactly there. What is the reward mechanism? The more you give, the more praise that you get from the media. People will give you as much. And then you slow walk yourself into a, a third world war. That's the exact opposite of what we should want. There is no incentive. I used to ask this stuff all the time. Uh, my, when, when I was most attacked by the White House press corps is when I would press Trump on the possibility of peace with North Korea. 
because I was most concerned about nuclear war. I'd be like, why don't you invite Kim Jong-un to the White House? Why are, when are you going to, do you view his recent outrage as a good faith? These are not the way that you get notice in the press corps or yeah. you get clips. The way you get notice is, why are you not more forcefully denouncing the Kim regime? I, listen, I think what's happening is terrible, but I want to avoid a nuclear exchange. The political so, rewards are yeah. always on the side of being hawkish, and this is why. The, I mean, the it. only yeah. time they like Trump is when he was bombing Syria. Yeah, that's a good I point. mean, right. every time. Like beautiful it's, sight or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. pride yeah. ones. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. But, yeah, yeah. And, and people are like, this is when he became president, yeah, he became you know, president. that whole thing. Yeah, I remember that. Um, yeah, the only political rewards are on the side of hawkishness. And this is how you end up with a landscape where overwhelmingly the American people are saying, we have to do more, we have mm -hmm. to do more, we have to do more, without recognizing how much we've already done, which is ex like extraordinary and historically unprecedented. But because the media's constant drumbeat is, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, of course that's the pr impression that's created. And this is where the three networks, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, are really basically indistinguishable. Totally you, party. you know, yeah, this is complete uniparty stuff, complete bipartisan consensus, always pushing in only one direction. And so you have to know if you're the Biden administration or the Obama administration or the Trump administration, that you are going to take a tremendous political hit because, of course, the American public, when they see you getting attacked from all sides for not doing enough, of course, that's going to have an impact on public opinion. We saw that very clearly with Afghanistan. I mean, that is when Biden's approval ratings really took yeah, a hit to and have never recovered because you had such a consistent drumbeat from the press. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. You know, you've got a lot of legislators. You already see a shift now. You've got some Democrats now calling for, hey, we got to get these fighter jets to them as well. No fly zone still is mostly off the table. But this is how you end up putting a lot of pressure on the politicians who all want to posture as the ones who are, you know, backing the tough thing and, and mm -hmm. doing the most. So it's a dangerous situation when you have this landscape. Combine it with, remember that exclusive story that we brought you, the audio about the White House press corps yeah. and who gets asked questions and Yeah, don't? that's right. Yeah, well, do you notice where all those people are sitting, folks? In the front row. Yeah. That's the mainstream media. And they get to rig the whole briefing. They get to decide how long it takes. They get to decide who gets asked the questions. The people in the back, people like yours truly, who used to be there trying, scrambling to try and get a question. Oh, you don't get a guaranteed question. And these people are the ones who might ask a dissident question about diplomacy. The questions matter. The incentive matters. The White House knows all three of the people they call on the front row who work for the cable networks will be played on loop for millions of people. Mm. And that is, again, yeah, feeds into the incentive structure of what they want to say, of how they want to message it to the people. And then when they ask these questions and drumbeat for war, there is no reward for diplomacy. I'll bring it back for the people who are not watching this fully or non-premium people. What I was talking about in the A block and the diplomacy block was this, which is that most attempts at peace fail. However, as many attempts as, many attempts as you can at peace happen, the more likely that peace eventually does yeah. occur. It takes a long time. And it's, it, you can think of it as kind of a negative feedback loop. Calling for peace is really hard because you know you want to save face and all of that. Diplomacy and negotiation is also very difficult. It almost always collapses. There's almost always incentives against it in order to keep fighting. But if you keep trying and trying and trying and trying and trying, eventually you will come to an outcome. And peace is easy. Like the type of negotiated settlement that they would have to come to here, which would involve some really significant concessions from Ukraine, like it's very easy to sort of posture Right. against that and, and to say, oh, you're still giving TV. Russia their way. Right. So that creates all these disincentives for the Biden administration to help support that diplomatic process. And that was another thing we talked about um, in the A block is you hear this consistent U.S. lawmakers very happy to talk about the sanctions. We got to do more. Very happy to mm -hmm. talk about the military weapons. But very little pressure, I mean, basically no pressure on the Biden administration to actually empower Zelensky in terms of the diplomatic negotiations to try to achieve some sort of deal here by empowering him to say, hey, if Russia actually comes to the table and actually does, right. you know, does their part and gives up a little bit too, that you 
are empowered to say we're going to roll back the sanctions that have been imposed by the U.S. Yeah. and NATO. I would so. love to see a question. What are the red lines for negotiations of the United States and any negotiated settlement between Ukraine and them? Would you agree with President Zelensky's uh, you know, ditching of NATO membership? Is that something that the United States would support? Does the Biden administration stand in support of a negotiated settlement whatsoever? Yeah. Great questions, right? You're not going to hear a single one of them. No, there's never, um, never any pressure for peace. Yeah, never happens. Be. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.